All right, so tonight we're going to be talking about the three earthly witnesses. All right, so three earthly witnesses. And like I said, all this is to aid us in eliminating uh, the Antichrist spirit. This is, uh, this is uh, you know, basic uh, uh, understanding so that we can get uh, get our doctrines right. Okay, before we do that, though, we're going to do our Hebrew nugget comes from a, a book called Atlas Geographics. It's got a long title I'm not going to read, but we got a link here to it. And we also, this book is also uh, in your old books folder. And in this particular book, uh, it's talking about the original, uh, in Africa, uh, what what the first, one of the first religions was in Africa, right? So this is, uh, Lee says, there are other kingdoms on the south frontiers of this country, which are inhabited by rich, industrious, and just sort of people. Uh, Judaism was the religion of the ancient Africans for a long time and succeeded by Christianity. But Mohammedism prevailed in the 208th year of the uh, Hegera, when all the Jews, Christians, and professors of the African religion that could be found were put to death. Yet in process of time, their intestine quarrels made them neglect Muhammad's law and revolt from the Caliph of Baghdad, for which they were uh, severely punished by the Muhammadan Caliphs who caused all their books to be burnt on suspicion that the knowledge of the arts and sciences prompt, prompted them uh, to contemn Muhammad's law. So this is a good resource. It's telling you that Judaism was there uh, uh, in, in uh, large parts of Africa first. And then uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, uh, converted over to Christianity, and then uh, Muhammad, uh, Muhammadism. So it's it's a it's a great resource. It, it gives you the succession of, of how these things uh, happen, and then you can go back and then you can study the migration patterns too, and you can kind of see what happens. Goes back to the other book, Tim Buck Two, and talks about. Uh, you know, in Timbuktu, how libraries and stuff were, were full of uh, were full of rich uh, knowledge. You know, during that time. But like I said, during you know after that, uh, when the Muhammadan took over, uh, you know they burned a lot of uh, books and stuff. All right, so it's a great resource. So check it out, download it, and get the opportunity. The three witnesses on Earth in First John five four through nine. It said, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. They're all one. All right. And then he says, and there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. Now, I want you to notice the, the, the language here. The first one said that these three are one. And then the next one says these three agree in one all right so they you know so he's saying the spirit the water and the blood are green in one all right and it's talking about we're talking about the messiah the spirit and the water and the blood all three agree in one so let's look at this this is a great question if you can't really just explain it right now what this is talking about uh this is what i mean by when we get into our studies what does this mean all right so let's talk about what what it means all right, okay so when we say that the blood and the and the water and the spirit are witnesses. Okay. What does being a witness mean? So to be a witness I means to bear witness to affirm that one has seen or heard or experienced something, or that he knows it because taught by divine revelation or inspiration, to give testimony, to utter honorable testimony, give a good report or to implore. So when we say those are three witnesses, we're saying that they're giving testimony. They're saying something to us, all right? And so not only are they giving testimony, but it's saying that they all have to agree in one, all right? So let's look at this a little bit further, all right? So uh, when we go back a little bit further and we look at this, it said, for whatsoever is born of Elohim overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Yeshua is the son of Elohim? This is he that came by water and blood, even Yeshua HaMashiach, not by water only, 
but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that bears witness because the spirit is truth. Then it goes on this, uh, to those scriptures that we just talked about. It said, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. And we receive the witness of men, the witness of Elohim is greater. But this is the witness of Elohim, which he has testified of his son. So when we begin to talk about the three agreeing, we're talking about agreeing in Yeshua. All right. So how then are these things agreeing with each other? How is the Holy Spirit uh, agreeing uh, with, with the water and with the blood? All right. So let's see this. Let's see how this thing is work. So what does it mean then to be born of the water? Because the scripture is saying here that he not he didn't come uh uh he came by water and blood, not by water only. So we've got to be able to distinguish that. So when we talk about being born of water, there is a quick definition in here when it says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same can Yeshua by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher, come from Elohim, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except Elohim be with him. Yeshua answered and said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of Elohim. Nicodemus said to him, How can, uh, can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Yeshua answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water. Now look at that terminology. And of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of Elohim. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. So when he says man be born in the water, he's saying that which is born of the flesh is flesh. So he's pointing to a fleshly uh, uh, birth. All right. And that which is born of the spirit uh, is spirit. Now he's talking to us about being born again. But at the same time, he's talking about himself encompassing these things. So, uh, you know, Yeshua was uh, born of the water and of the blood. So that means he was born of a woman in the flesh. But he also had the Holy Spirit within him. All right. So let's keep that in mind. So being born of the water. Born of the blood. So what are we pointing to when we begin to talk about being born? of the blood because he said this is he that came by water and blood not by water only all right so when we talk about him being born of blood and we go to leviticus 17 and it says the the for the life and that word is 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 really means soul in this particular scripture of the flesh is in the blood so it's giving us this clue that the soul resides uh in the blood all right. And then Hebrews uh, 9 22, it also tells them almost all things are, are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood, is no remission of sin. But the soul is being housed in the blood. All right. So if the soul is being housed in the blood, this is telling us that Yeshua had to have a soul because it's talking about the blood. So when he came, he came by water. He was born of a woman in the flesh, and he had a soul. And not just spirit, but he had he had a soul. So he was born a man, had soul and spirit, and he was born in the flesh. So in other words, he is like us. All right. So he's get he's he's putting that out there clearly so that we won't uh have any uh you know misjudgments about it. So if anybody comes to us saying any other thing, then we know that they're lying. He came like us, except he had no sin of his own when he came. He was a lamb without spot or blemish. All right, so now we've got to talk about it being a witness because we talked about the blood and the water being witnesses. What are they witnesses to? What are they seeing or what are they testifying to uh, judiciously? Because this is judicial language that he's using. What, what are we saying? All right, so when we go to Genesis 4, 9 through 11, uh, we get an idea of what's going on here. And said, so Lord said to Cain, where is Abel thy brother? He said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? He said, what hast thou done? He said, the voice 
of thy brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. All right. So we, when we look this scripture up in, in Hebrews 11, it says, by faith, Abel offered up Elohim, unto Elohim a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Elohim testifying of his gifts and by it being de uh, dead yet speaketh. So he was saying that out of his blood, then Abel was able to speak. All right. Uh, you know, we'll go a little bit deeper into this in a little bit, but he was able to speak because his soul was housed in the blood and out of the blood, Abel spoke. All right. And so, because we just said that the soul is housed in the blood. All right. So the witness of the blood, when we go back to Adam, we begin to talk about uh, the blood. The blood, when housing the soul, is witnessing whether or not the soul is going to make the right decision. All right. And with Adam, because he made the wrong decision, the spirit left him because the blood was a witness against him. All right, so we'll you know just get that the blood was a witness against Adam and because the blood was a witness against Adam, the spirit had to leave because they they did not agree in the one. All right, so Yeshua had to come down and he had to agree in his blood. He had to agree in the water. He had to agree in the spirit. All had to agree in the one. So when we begin to talk about the witness of the water, let's look at this. John 4, 9 through 14. This is the story of the Samaritan uh, woman. And it said, then said this woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou being a Jew ask his drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Yeshua answered and said to her, if thou knewest the gift of Elohim and who it is that said to thee, give me to drink, thou would have asked of him and he would have given thee living water. The woman said to him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank there, thereof himself and his children and his cattle? It should answer and say to her, Whoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a whale of water springing unto everlasting life. All right, so now he's talking about the living water. All right, so we got three entities here that has to agree in Yeshua. Number one, he has to have or keep living water on the inside of him. And the only way to keep the living water inside of him is that his blood can't testify against him, has to testify and agree with him. And the only way that his blood is going to continue to testify for him is that if his soul follows that of the Holy Ruach. All right, so we got the Holy Ruach. We got his soul that has followed the Holy Ruach. So if his soul follows the Holy Ruach, since it's in the it housed in the blood, then the blood will be a uh, will testify for him, and if the blood testify for him, the water that comes out of him gives life. I hope that makes sense. All right, so we'll look at this again. So the Holy Ruach. So we look at the three witnesses in heaven: the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ruach. All right, the link between what's on he in heaven and on earth is the Holy Ruach. All right, because we see the Holy Ruach not only in the three witnesses in heaven, but we also see the Holy Ruach in the three witnesses that are on earth. All right, that have to agree in the one. All right, so we see that the Holy Ruach cannot sin because it's coming uh, directly from the Father. We see the blood, which is the abode of the soul, and the soul can sin, the soul has the ability to sin. So when Yeshua came, he had the ability to sin, to go against what the Holy Ruach was telling him. But he always refused to go against it. Had he went against it, the blood would have testified against him. And then the Holy Ruach would have left him. 
and then the water of life that was coming out of him to give to other people would have been null and void. And so the, the water would know would, would would not have given life. It would have been like what Adam gave, and he was just passed on death. So I'm gonna say that again. Hope that makes sense. The link is the holy rock. And as long as Yeshua's soul chose the holy ruach, his blood testified on his behalf because his soul uh, uh, lived in the blood. And as long as they agreed the, the, with the soul and the blood agreed, the blood testified as a witness for him. All right. So then because the blood was testifying for him, he was able to give life from that which was in him. And so that's why he talks about out of our belly, uh, you know, flowing rivers of living water because he himself was able to give that living water because he was in agreement all the way around. His soul always agreed with the Holy Ruach. His blood was a witness to it. And the fact that he was able to give life was also a witness uh, to the unity in one. All right, so I'm hoping that makes sense. All right, so when we go to Isaiah 53, we see, we're going to see when Yeshua's blood was poured out, his soul was in his blood. I'm going to show you that right there. He said, he shall see the travail of his soul. He shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. This was a prophecy of Yeshua and the work he was going to do. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he has poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgression, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So when his blood was shed, because his soul was in the blood, he, was, he, he considered himself to be poured out with his blood. So he poured out uh, his soul uh, for us. But the blood was always a witness for him that he never strayed away from the will of the Holy Ruach. And because his, his, his soul never strayed away from the will of the Father, then he was able to become sin for us and bear our nickname. But when hell couldn't, didn't have anything against him, hell had to let him go. And he was able to get the Holy Ruach back because his blood was a witness for him that he had never messed up. He was also able to give, you know, of this, of this life that we're talking about uh, because they all agreed in the one. All right. So we see this in John 20, that he was able to give of the living waters. And it said, and when he had said, uh, he was talking to the, to the disciples after the resurrection. And he said, when he, had, he, when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Yeshua to them again, peace be unto you, as my father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. All right, so you see them now being given uh, the living waters. He's given it to them. Now, the only way, like you said, he could give this is that he had to be in agreement in the one. So while he was in the flesh, one of the water, you know, and his soul was in his blood, and he was following the guidance of the Holy Ruach, he didn't mess up one time because all three of those witnesses are there to say he didn't. Because if he had, his blood would have with a witness against him like Adam and he had like Adam passed sin from one to the other Yeshua only thing he would have been able to pass on is sin but we were already in sin so we were just stayed in the condition uh, that we were in but because he did not then he was able to be the giver of the living waters which is the Holy Ruach all right so now because he gave us that living water then he said, I need you to believe on me a certain way. So he said, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Yeshua stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. All right. But this he spake of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Yeshua was not yet 
glorify him. All right, so now we're talking about being able to give uh, to others if we believe on him, as the scripture said. So let's look at this graph again. And I want to make sure that we, we understand what's going what's going on here. All right. You know, we say the uh what what people call the the Lord's Prayer, which you know, it was just a mold of mold of how he was telling us we should pray. He said, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All right. So the one who was able to do his will on earth the same way that it was in heaven was Yeshua himself. All right. So because he agreed in th in the three, the three agreed in the one, then he was able to hold up uh, his end of the bargain. All right. So we know that the Holy Ruler cannot sin. We know that while Yeshua uh, was on the earth, he had the soul that abode in the blood. The blood was there. And if he messed up, it would have witnessed against him. And the fact that he was able to continue to give life, uh, you know, uh, and, and do the miracles and do all these things while he was on the earth, you know, uh, you know, witness for him. And so he had all three agreeing in the one as proof uh, that he did, well, he did the work the way he was supposed to do the work. All right. So. This brings us to a question, then what about our blood? Well, our blood, because we got our blood from, from Adam, uh, our blood was messed up from the beginning, all right? And so trying to go to the, to the most high with our own blood, I mean, we, we were corrupt in our own blood. It, it just wasn't going to do it for us because the blood was a witness already against us. Our blood was witnessing against us. All right, so this is why, you know, when we got ready to leave uh, for the Passover, we had to get something symbolically that was innocent. And he said, go get the lamb's blood and put it on the doorpost because I want to hear the blood of something innocent. So when death comes over, I hear the blood of something innocent and death passes by. Yeah, yeah, I get what I'm saying because uh, you know the the soul that's in the blood is crying out, whether or not it's innocent or it's guilty, and because the lamb itself uh, had no consciousness of sin, then the only uh, cry that it could cry out was the cry of innocence, and so that's why he had to get a lamb or an animal that without spot or blemish, so he could hear the blood of that animal, and that blood would remind him of the blood that his son was going to shed when he came down to the earth. So this is, um, it's good stuff, man. Once you begin to understand what the significance of the blood, significance of the, of the water, all those type of things. Even takes you back to John, like what we were talking about earlier, why I like to study John, when you, when you go into the book of John and the first miracle that Christ uh, performed was turning the water uh, into wine. All right. And so when you look at that really closely, the water pots that were there were, were really cisterns, these stone cisterns where they use that water to to uh, bathe or to purify themselves. And so there were these these barrels of, 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 of water was made of stone. And uh, this was the manner that the scripture said of, of purifying uh, the Jews. So by him getting their mode of purification and telling them to bring it to him, what he was saying is that this mode of purification is not it. I mean, I know this is your custom. I know this is what you've been doing, but this mode of purification ain't going to get it for you. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn this water <laughs> into wine to give you an indication that the mode of purification that you're going to have to have is the wine that I've been prophesying for all these thousands of years. And the wine is pointing to my very blood. <laughs> See, that's why Yeshua said what he said when she came to him and he, and he said, woman, well, what do I have to do with you? My time, my hour has not yet come. He was talking about the hour that he was going to have to shed his blood. And so, 
uh, you know, but then he went ahead and he performed the miracle anyway because he was pointing to that owl by changing that water, which was really doing them no good unless the blood, uh, you know, water had been, uh, uh, you know, followed up or preceded by uh, the blood. It's powerful pictures there, man. And that's why I say we had to ask the questions, what does this mean? What was he talking about? And there's always something there that we, we haven't got yet. Or it should be something that we, we just see that we hadn't we hadn't got it yet. But uh all right, so I'm gonna open it up for questions and we'll we'll go from there. I saw Sylvia, she had her her hand up. Uh Shabbat Shalom. Um uh, Kendall and everybody. Yeah, I had it up early. I was like, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I got I think I'm clear on the to the graph because I'm a visual person. So the graph really uh helped me out there. But my question was you you brought up John, the 27th chapter, when he came to reveal and show himself after he resurrect after he resurrected. Mm -hmm. And you said that he and it read that he gave him the holy the holy rura. Mm -hmm. And my question is, is this before they were at the um uh, day of Pentecost? Absolutely. Yeah. 40, okay. 40 days before, yeah. So so or 50 days before, I'm sorry. So it was a demonstration of them coming together and, and agreeing. And is that why the Ruach uh uh demonstrated as it did? Right, and I, and I, and that's one of the things that we have to kind of shake off is that we is a lot of people think that the people didn't receive the Holy Spirit until the day of Pentecost. There was a demonstration of the power of the Holy Rock on the day of Pentecost, but they had already received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Okay, and that was before he said when he was warning them that he was leaving. He said, "I won't leave you." I won't right. leave you comfortless I, that the Holy Spirit will be. Will be yeah, there. but this, yeah, when he did this, what we read, it was the day of the resurrection. The day of the resurrection. Okay. Yeah, yeah he met them in there and where they were hiding. He met them there. He had already resurrected. So he had already proven that the blood, the water, and the spirit uh, agreed. agreed. And so now he was able to give them, <laughs> permanently give them, if they believed on him, uh, the, the indwelling of the Holy Ruach. It makes more sense now, because when you when we go go to church and you know how it used to tarry for the Holy Ghost and all of that, but it wasn't until we believed and my in our in our soul that He died for our sins and that He would bless us with the Holy Ghost is when the Holy Ghost was present in us. Right. Wow, that's deep. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks. So, so when we believe the scripture said, and I, I try to find a scripture for you. Said, but from the moment that we first believe, that's when the Holy Spirit entered into us. That's powerful. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. I'm not sure who's on the iPhone, but whoever iPhone is. Oh, that's that's probably me. Good evening, mm -hmm. everyone. I just had a quick question. So, is the soul immortal? Well, uh, that's a good question. Uh, if he allows it to be, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> be because he he makes a statement that you know don't fear a man who is or you know who is only able to kill your body, but to fear him who is also able to destroy both body and okay. soul. Yeah, right. Okay. So that's the reason I, I put the caveat in there. If he wants to. So if we're washing the blood and, and our soul is indwelt by the Holy Ruach because of the blood that he, he, he washed us in, yeah, it's immortal at that point. Okay, so at the second death, that's when it would be destroyed completely. And that's a, that's a good uh, question simply because, because of the language that scripture used. You know, the, the, you know, you sure indicates that he can destroy the soul. So then there becomes a question then if somebody, you know, individual goes to hell or goes to the lake of fire or whatever, is there is that an indeterminate period of time? Is that really forever, forever? Or will he destroy their soul in the lake of fire? 
Okay. But that's an excellent uh, study that we can do. You know, some of the scriptures make it look like that it's just you, you, you know, you forever. You know, we know that the angels will be forever for them, the ones that rebel. But will individuals have a forever existence in hell? I don't know the answer to that fully. You know, because you know, okay. sometimes there's an indication that the individual you know, uh, souls, uh, you know, would just cease to be. Right. And then sometimes it almost reads like they'll, you know, they'll suffer forever. So that's one I've always had, uh, you know, uh, conflict with. But we'll try to do some more study on that and come to a resolution. I just want to be open about how I felt felt about that because it's, it's you know, when Yeshua says he's able to destroy it, right. and then, he, then he warns us, you know, he says that, you know, really that hell was designed not for us, but for the devil and his angels. You know, he's given us clues uh, there to, that we need to kind of seek out. That's an excellent okay. question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Judy? Yes, I just have a, a question. Um, is Son of Man always referring to Christ, the Messiah? Uh, yeah, uh, most of the time in Scripture, when it, when, it, when it starts talking, Son of Man is pointing to. Pointing okay. To okay, the reason why I ask it, when you start reading about the blood, uh, I just heard Ezekiel 6 and 4. And I guess Jerusalem was in a sick place. Can I read just the sixth verse? Yeah, go ahead. It says, and when I passed by thee, and I saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live, yea. I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. But the scriptures above is talking about, I guess it's talking about the children of Israel or Jerusalem, and he says that thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite and thy mother a Hittite. And as for thy nativity, in the day thou wast born, thy navel was not cut, neither was thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou was not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. None I pitied thee to do all of these unto thee, to have compassion upon thee, but thou wast cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou wast born. So can you relate this to the John that you just read to as uh, being unclean, but you must be washed in the blood also? Right, yeah, he's telling us the condition okay. that we were in. He's telling us that, uh, you know, that the, that the Canaanites and the Hittites were, were basically there first you know, uh, and uh, that we followed after them, you know, in the land, you know, so he's giving us our history. He's telling us how, how dirty we are, but he's also telling us that he's going to, he, you know, after he, after, after he tells us our condition, he also makes promises about how he's going to bring us back oh, okay. in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? I do have a question, Kendall. Okay. This is this. My name is Lita. I normally don't speak. I just usually listen. But um, so you had mentioned uh, the Lord's Prayer, and um, use that use that as an example. It does say does because it reads in earth. Does that change anything? So it says in earth as it is in heaven. Does that change anything? Because I know most times we read it as on earth, but in scripture it says in. Does that change anything? No, I look at it a little bit closer to make sure, but I don't. I don't think so. Uh, you know, he's basically saying that that the same way that there's that obedience in his, in, you know, in his realm, you know, there's there's going to be that same obedience on this realm. Okay, uh, I just. And, yeah, but I mean, you you make an excellent point. You had to look at every word. So yeah, I have to go back and and, and look at that again, and make sure. Uh, okay. But um, yeah, yeah, but I think the I, overall point is. You know that you know there's going to be obedience not only just uh, in the heavens but also on earth as well and it started with the obedience of the messiah that makes sense okay and my second point is um you <clears throat> you said in john 7 38 um the the living water is the holy rock right mm -hmm. 
Um, is there any, and I don't know why it came to me as you said it, I just, when you said that, I thought about the, the rivers um, that are talked about in Genesis in the Garden of Eden. Is, the, is that representation of the Holy Rock in, in that picture from the beginning? Yeah, and that's okay. what's so that's what's so great about what he does. He's still trying to tell us that he's all one, because uh, you know he's he's pointing to the rivers of living water. Then you go back, uh, and he also said the washing of the water by the word. So they're, they're, he's 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 combining those two. But then when you talk talking about the rivers of living water, that's an excellent point because when you go back to the garden and you and you see the water flowing from basically the the throne room of, 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 of Yah himself, then you get to the book of Revelations and you see the living waters coming out of the throne uh, of Yah. So he's pointing to, uh, he's pointing to those, those, those rivers of life that's coming from the throne it, itself, you know, the origin of things. So yeah, that's a great observation. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that, that speaks volumes. <clears throat> so thank you for that. Yes, ma'am. All right, Novell. Good evening. Uh, shalom. Sorry I'm late. Uh, I took my granddaughter to uh, I, the snow thing. But anyway, I was uh, reading. I'm, uh, I, I missed the lesson. But anyway, I was reading today in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 30. I think it's 30 or uh, 31. Anyway, uh, verses six and eight, six, six and seven, somewhere around there. Um, that uh, Yah said he will say he would uh, get Judah and Israel out of their captivity, and he will save them. Uh, from their sins, even though they turned their back on it. It's a beautiful scripture. I would have to look it up, but I can't right now um, because I'm on the road trying to make it home. Uh, but it's beautiful what he said. And then in the book of Daniel, I think it's chapter nine, where he tells us to turn to the east and pray for the sins of our ancestors who sinned against him because that's where the sin originated from um, when we sit, put Christ to death and put it, uh, and they said, put it on our children. So uh, I was listening to this boy named Kanye. Uh, but anyway, he don't make sense to me. Sometimes he do, sometimes he don't, but I don't pay that much. I, I don't get that much out of him. But what he said was, we were, I wanted to write to him anyway and tell him about this. You don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I wanted to tell him that, um, you know, we didn't commit the sin that put us in slavery. Slavery was upon us because of the sins of our ancestors. Now we had our own part to play, you know, but we didn't commit the sin uh, you know, because they said, put this on our children and our children's children, something like that. Anyway, that's where we came into play. The 400 years came into play because of what they said. And God told Abraham this, uh, and Abraham seen what was going on. That was in your lesson uh, last week. Abraham seen, and he seen Christ was going to save everybody. So I was just bringing that up because of what somebody else had said. Uh, but I don't know. He said, I'm going to bring Judah and Israel. He didn't say uh, those that are alive. He said he just going to save and, and save them for his sake. He gone, but they gonna pay for their sins one way or the other. However, you know, he is gonna clean them up, not for the, because of what they did to him. You know how they neglected and re uh, refused to obey him and all this kind of stuff. And you know, we did our own thing, our own sin against him. But 
you know, God is so good, Carol, you know, we have to remember that God is not short of his word. And these old books tell you a lot of things like you, the, the book of uh, uh, Abraham, the apocalypse of Abraham. That book tells you this. And then you verified it in the book of John, I believe, when John said, Abraham saw me. And before Abraham was, I am. I love it. I love that name, I am. But, you know, sometimes we have to really go and study these things out. And so when you come in with this word, powerful word that you be giving us, we'll be prepared to see and ask questions that are pertaining to what you're teaching. Right. So, so I appreciate you. Yes, ma'am. And so when we, when we start talking about, you know, the condition that we're, we're, we're in as a people, you know, he, he tells us to repent of, of three things. You know, so if if he's telling us to repent of those three things, then all three of those are responsible. <laughs> you, you, you get what I'm saying? So if he tells us to repent of what our forefathers did, then they're responsible. Then he tells us, you know, to repent, uh, you know, uh, for what, you know, we've done, you know, individually, you know, then, you know, and then we had to repent for, I, I think, what, uh, you know, our, our, you know, our people uh, as a whole are doing, then all three of those are responsible for the condition uh, yeah. that, that that we're in. So, yeah, and then so when he talks like that, he's saying, you know, repenting for our fathers. Most of the time, is because we we take on what what the fathers taught us, and we continue in those things. Yeah, yeah. You know, so you know, we, the traditions and things that are not of him, we continued in those things. We can see in our own lives the things that we took traditionally that's not of y'all and we continue to right. do those things. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. All good right. Uh, okay. Did, did, was that it? Yeah, that's it. Thanks for letting me share. Yes, ma'am. All right. James, okay. you? I'm reading. Um... Let's see, I have to write it down because my brain is not working. I wanted to uh, first give uh, a word of encouragement to my sister who is struggling with the Bible. Um, there was a time in my on my journey where I was struggling with uh, church and, you know, I was going to church and doing all the things, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't satisfying. So then I did this, well, let me see. Uh, at that time I called him, Jesus was a Jew. I, did Jews do things this way? And then I went to study and I found out, no, G, uh, Jews practiced in a different way. So what happened? Julie jumped up and went into Judaism and learned all the Jewish things. I'm looking at you, look, learning all these Jewish things, you know, to do, because I wanted to, because I really had a heart for Yah, got me? Had a heart for Yah. And so I learned all these Jewish things and I learned how to do, you know, the lighting of the candles, the whole nine, okay? And then I found out as I went on that journey, um, they had, they had their own particular <laughs> issues. Now, uh, so then I thought, nope, this is not it. So one day while I was at home as a, a mother of about that time, I had five. So about that time, it was around three, uh, just had a baby, couldn't go back to work. I just took out my Bible, which now, oh, let me just back one step because uh, they stay with more of the Tanakh, they don't go into the, uh, the New Covenant. And so, and then they made statements on how the Torah or the first five books of the Bible were interfered with. And so then it was really a problem because they, you know, I learned all that. So I was now afraid of my Bible. <laughs> okay, it was interfered with, the rabbis came in and they stood up and this is a part in that, so now I'm really afraid at home by myself with two, three kids out in 
out in a desert somewhere, but had still had a heart for the Lord. So what I did was, I just, uh, what I did was I said, Lord, I don't know where you are in this, in the word. I don't know, but I want to know you. I, I, I desire to be your daughter. Help me. That's all I said. Then uh, later is the story, but I'm not going into that. I was told to, to just read it. Just read it. Not, not trying to pull anything out of it. Just read it. And, and allow the spirit to show you where to read. I'm not even going to tell you where. Just read it and read it and read it. And I can tell you that over time, that reading was planting seeds that I didn't know anything about. But it was planting seeds. Even if I didn't understand it at the time, it was still planting seeds. So after a while, those seeds started to come up with roots and then plants. So I just want to encourage you. Now, it didn't happen overnight still. But as you allow his word, which is the bread of life, as you feed on that and allow the spirit, uh, the water, to quench that thirst, it will happen. Because it's Yah's word and the, the work is his. It's Amen. all his. It's not us. That's what we're learning in class. It's all his. Don't be afraid. Just get, just don't understand it. Just when you get to something you don't understand, you don't understand. Read it anyway. So that's my encouragement to you. And then Kendall, uh, because I've been studying uh, uh, John, it's funny that you would be, um, I've been studying John and I have a question for you and I don't know if this is, um, you know, I've heard that um, a lot of teachers that are teaching who we are uh, uh, on the YouTube are having a lot of problems. Hope this don't get you in any problems, but I do have a question. Um, and I think it's, uh, it said, uh, for, for Yah so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth him shall not die, but have everlasting life. Now, my question is, it says the lamb of Yeshua, Yesh, uh, uh, the lamb of Yah, Yeshua, our savior, some call him Jesus. Was he sent, oh, now that I know that I'm in Israel. Was he sent to take away the sins of the world? Uh, uh, or was, it, was he sent for the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Help us to get to where we could be lights to and then bring in the world. I know the world has this. I know the nations have their place. Um, but my question is, is it, was it his will? Uh oh, sorry about my back. Um, was it his will to uh, get to us first as a people and then the nations? I, 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 I kind of thought that because when John said that, I would imagine there weren't hardly any other nations at the time that he was speaking to Israelites that may have known about the us, uh, the, the, what the priests did on a continual basis is sacrificial land. And then they would understand what, when he said, there, um, look, the Lamb of God who take away the sins of the world. Then I, I would have believed that the Hebrews would have understood, uh, the Israelites who were in the know would understand more than the world. So I wanted to know that. Um, and, and then from that, then the world would, you know, the world then sing our light, sing his light, sing him, sing the light of him in us. And based on the scripture that says, I'll bless those that bless you, or curse those that curse you, and how we were to be a reflection. Am I off base? Were we, it's this first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Is that how it was supposed to be? Right. I mean, that's, that's, that's exactly how. Uh, Yeshua came down, you know, 
And like you said, when he came down, he didn't come down remembering everything, the whole covenant that he had agreed to in the heavens. He couldn't. You know, he had to forget and he had to walk by faith. So at that moment that he was coming through, even though the plan was to eventually extend the, uh, you know, the gospel to the Gentiles, at that moment, he was focusing only on Israel. Okay, you know, that, that was his thought. It hadn't been revealed to him yet that this was, uh, this was to the Gentiles, but he knew one thing. And he knew when you when you re re start reading that, and he started saying stuff like, "Nobody uh, can come to me unless the Father sent them." Mm -hmm. So he's he's living by faith. He's he's living by what he knows at that moment. And then he's saying, "But you know, and nobody can come, you know, go to the Father except they come through me." So when the when the when the uh, you know Syrophoenician woman came to him, you know, saying, "My daughter is grievously vexed." And and he says, well, it's, you know, it's not me for me to, you know, give my bread to the dogs. Well, he's saying, you know, I'm, I came for Israel. In his thought process, he didn't come for her. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. So then she says, yeah, but even uh, the dogs can eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then, you know, it triggered in him what he knew, uh, the, the, you know, the, of, of the covenant that, that Yah had made with Israel and, and, the, and the gleaning of the fields for the, for the strangers and all these things, that there was an entryway for them if they believed. And so he knew then that the Father had sent her. Yeah, okay. And so the Father started revealing to him. And, and, and you know, this is one of the only times in Scripture when, when, the, uh, when this woman and then when the, uh, when the, uh, the uh, soldier came, you know, sent sent uh, people to him, and he said that he was he was amazed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why was he amazed? He said because of the faith of non-Israelites, and then all the other time that he was shocked was of the lack of faith of Israel. So if he was shocked at the lack of faith of Israel, then that in and of itself tells you what his expectations were. You wouldn't be shocked at something that you were expecting. All right. So he was shocked at the fact that, that Israel was ready. But as time went on, it was revealed to him, uh, you know, uh, you know what, you know, what the plan was, that he was going to be rejected by his own. You know, and that was going to open the door up to. Uh, to the to the gentile but you know there was a remnant of us that you know came to him first you know most of the first uh uh you know uh we could say church but most of the first church was us it was israel and he gave the commandment how to go about preaching the gospel i want y'all he i want you to preach it to you know israel first you know i want you to go to all all the nations where they are and preach it and then after you get through, he gives a specific sequence of how he wants to do it, you know, or how he wants to do it. So, uh, yeah, so his mindset initially was, but, you know, then you look at Yah's overall mindset. He had already prophesied that he was going to have to raise up another nation that was not Israel. Mm -hmm. So the master plan in the heavens was to give an opportunity for the Gentiles to come in. Could that have also been the other sheep? Remember, he said, I have sheep. This flock, then he said, I have sheep of another flock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that exactly. Was, yeah, I, I believe that's what he was referring to. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Ken. Yes, ma'am. And then Romans, Romans 11 confirms that as well. So, uh, in, in the prophets, too, it talks about it. All right. Um, what was, what was supposed to be controversial there? I'm wondering, do you said there were some folks online um, getting in trouble for? Yeah, um, what's what's going on? I've just been kind of, uh, what do you call it? I guess they call it surfing. You know, older people, we all know. We just look. <laughs> oh, he's looking. speaking for herself. Uh, so, but some of the people that, uh, you know, they have like, we're awake kind of ministries. And um, some of them are really being hassled through YouTube um, because they're saying we're anti-Semitic and or, you know, we're, we're like 
a hate group. And, you know, you're hearing all these kind of things. So I just want to be careful of um, make, because I, I, I so love our study. And I just think it would be tragic if something came out of my mouth that would cause a problem for Kenda. But what I'm saying is there are uh, groups, and so I've heard some that I, and, but there are some real sincere, in my opinion, real sincere people who love, uh, love, love the master, yet um, what they're saying may sound to someone who doesn't understand that it's, uh, we're biased for ourselves and we hate them. And that's mm -hmm. not true. They're not teaching that. But again, since we kind of are one of the hated people anyway now on this planet, you know, any old excuse will do. That that's where it's happening. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean I mean I, I hear teachers out there that are, are not correct all the time, but you know, just the way it just is, is what it is at this point. We had to be able to wade through the uh wade through the mud and see what's true and, and, and what's not true. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think too, that people don't realize even when dealing with the Gentiles is what Romans 11 is really saying to the Gentile. And so he's saying, look at Israel and they were cut off. You know, same thing can happen to you, you know. Uh, even the ones that, you know, believe, you know, what he's saying is you're still not going to avoid you know, the areas where you're not, you're not going to avoid the judgment, basically, that's what I'm saying. And so, you know, the their teaching right now is they, you know, pretty much they can do what they want to treat us in the way they want to treat us. And even the believers, true believers, you know, they have this false doctrine. They just think that they're going to come get ratcheted up out of here and there's no consequence for anything. And scripture just does not bear that out. Right. So uh, they're gonna have, they're gonna have to deal with that. They're gonna deal, even the ones that he's calling. You know, he's gonna correct them. So there's a lot there's a lot going on out there. There's teaching there's camps that teach that, that no Gentiles is just all Israel. You know, and so you know that's a false that's a false doctrine. Well, so, yeah, I don't know what your thoughts are, Kendall. Um, would love to hear your your thoughts on the teaching of John three sixteen as the the main gospel message, you know, that we that's promoted versus Romans 1 16, which says it's the, you know, you know, Yeshua HaMashiach is the power of God unto salvation, first for the Jews and then for the Gentiles. It just seems like the latter would be a better and more truthful uh, way of presenting the gospel as opposed to John 3 16, which has everybody believe that all you have to do is just believe in Jesus and, and you'll be saved. Right. Uh, you know, John 3.16 is pointing to the work that, that the Messiah did. And he's he's also pointing to the putting emphasis on the fact that he died well enough for everybody. But that doesn't mean everybody's gonna accept his work. Right. So there's then there's no excuse. See if we if we create the doctrine that he only died well enough for us, then there's an accusation against him that in his work wasn't complete enough to be inclusive. He was unfair. He didn't give them an opportunity. <laughs> that's, but that's not true. You can't put that on him. He died well enough and grand enough to bring anybody in who had the heart toward him. And that's the point he's trying to uh, trying to get across, but not everybody's going to accept that. So, And he had a plan. He came to us first. You know, those who received him was a remnant, scripture say, but for the most part, he had to give us ears that we couldn't hear and, and, and eyes that we couldn't see, and he blinded us, but he said just for a, a, a temporary period of time. And he said when the time of the Gentile end, guess what? He's going to open up our ears again, he's going to open up our eyes, and we're starting to see those things happen. But it's in his, his time. All right, Al. Hey, all the shoulders. How's it going? All right. Good, good. Uh, I kind of had a two-part question. Um, 
the first question was linked uh, back to the study. Um, and I was going to ask about the blood that you had touched on earlier, but since the conversation is kind of going this way with, you know, John 316, Romans, um, how do you, according to scripture and, you know, your study, how do you view what Israelites should be doing with each other right now and what our relationship should be like with the Gentile world? Because that's something that I can see, you know, even in my own a walk sometimes I struggle with is like to relate to Gentile believers, uh, knowing that there's so much of what I believe that they find offensive, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, um yeah, that's that's a that's a broad one, but how do we how do we well the best the best way I can explain, maybe if I say this we'll get we'll get down to some weeds. You, can I can I make it more specific then? Okay, yeah. I guess great. what I guess what's our responsibility towards each other as Israelites? What's our responsibility towards the Gentiles? You know, well, uh, you know, he he tells us that our responsibility toward each other, those who are in the household of faith, is that we we've got to we got to be dedicated to each other. We have got to love each other. He said, you know, he says, especially, he says that we're especially of those in the household of faith. So whether we are Israel in the household of faith or, you know, uh, Gentiles who have been grafted into the household of faith, uh, we have to love one another with that, uh, with that zeal. All right. And he talks about loving us in a, in a way that uh, having compassion on each other, you know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, 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 hold on. So, so just to dig into that question a little mm -hmm. more, when you say others that are in the household of faith, how do we make that determination? Because that's challenging to me as well. So for instance, I meet somebody from a Catholic uh, faith. They do believe in Yahushua and seemingly have a, a genuine, you know, attraction towards understanding and towards growing. But there's a lot of false doctrine that we, you know, or at least I believe that they hold. And I know that you hold the same position that most people in here. Is that person also considered of the faith? Like, how do we make that determination? Yeah, I mean, we have to be able to, to discern the spirit by the spirit, you know, and, and get into what they actually believe, right? And at the same time, uh, th there are certain people, even though they're believers, that we can't walk with. Uh, how can two walk together unless they agree on, on, on things? So, you know, I know a lot of people that I, I know are believers in the basic belief of the Messiah, but they're, you know, they're, they're really not seeking after him. So they have this, just this basic belief and then they still accepting all of these other things. You can't walk with, with people like that, according to, according to what, you know, the scripture, you know, you just can't. You have to let them let them go their way and do their thing. You know, pray for them, and you can love people. Love is how I treat you. So you can love people, but that don't mean that you gotta, you know, you know, you know, walk with them, you know, in their, you know, in a, you know, with them, you know, because you can't, you know, because they're gonna be doing things that, you, according to your walk that you said you were you were not going to do so i think that's where the discernment uh comes in doesn't mean that you know you think you're better it's just that you're on a different path so that that makes sense do you still and and you say based on discernment you consider whether you think they're in the faith or not in the faith right you know uh you can tell what somebody's seeking seeking the messiah what spirit they have and then you can tell when people receive truth or reject truth, um, and whether or not they get angry about truth all the time. And then they just, you can give them, some people you can give uh, 999 facts and they'll make up a, the thousandth one and believe in that one. Now, I'm telling you, uh, you, you, can, you, can, you can walk in the sermon of the way these people uh, do things. And it becomes obvious after a point that, hey, wait a minute, this this guy's walking, uh, you know, in in some type of deceit. He's he, it's a different spirit. You, you begin to discern uh, these people. Um, 
So, you know, you stay away from those people. That's a that's a, that's a good that's a good good answer and uh, something for me to chew on as I dig into the script. Uh, the second question that I had was more to, related to the first study, and uh, basically I was I was and I don't know if somebody might have asked this before because I had my son with me so I got a little off 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 the track. But what relationship did the blood of animals play into the whole process um, in the Old Testament? uh versus or what people call the old testament versus what people call the new testament yeah that's a that's a good question uh i always go back back to the scripture that said there's there's one there's one uh lord or one yah yahuwah or however you want to say yahweh one faith and one baptism all right so when we when we started talking about uh the blood of the animal the blood of the animal was pointing to the messiah so the person was not putting their faith in the animal itself you know especially uh you know the ones that that were really enlightened like abraham Isaac, Jacob, they were putting their faith in the promise of what the messiah was going to do because when they passed down from generation to generation they passed down the promise that yah had made to adam and eve you know, and and he told them that her seat, what her seat was going to do. So he explained the sacrificial system to him, but he also explained that the sacrificial system is is a uh, is a temporary system pointing to the work that he was going to do. And so when you go back and read some of the old writings, you'll see that they understood this by faith. All right. So um, when we, well, you know, we read that scripture about um, the blood crying from the ground. And we talked about the soul of Abel being in the blood. And, and 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 you could hear the cry. The scripture also indicated that it wasn't bec he wasn't heard because of his own blood. He was heard because of the sacrifice, the faith that he had uh in obedience to Yah about the sacrifice that Yah had given him to follow through with. So he he was so let me pull up let me pull up that scripture. So basically, it's coming down to faith. All right. So let me see. All right. So when we look at Genesis 4 and 9, it said, in Hebrews 11, it said, By faith, Abel offered unto Elohim a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Now, what he said, by which, what does by which mean? He said, by which the more excellent sacrifice. He obtained witness that he was righteous. Elohim testifying of the gift. And by it, talking about the gift, he being dead, yet speaketh. <laughs> so it was the it was him trusting Yah's plan of the sacrifice that was coming and going through the offering up of the animal, looking forward by faith to the uh to the future sacrifice that he was able to be heard of uh, by Yah. Yah was able to hear his voice because his own blood was corrupt. So every time someone made a sacrifice back then, you know, uh, that, that understood the way of Yah, they understood that there was a Messiah coming and they were believing in the Messiah. So whether you were born before the Messiah or after Messiah, it's still that one faith you still believing you know those who were before messiah was believing that he was coming to pull them out of the situation those of us after believe that he already came and pull us out of the situation but it's still one faith and so he had given them that system to demonstrate their faith by saying you know by taking the animal and, and putting the sins on the animal, knowing that this was a picture of what the future Messiah would do. Are there any scriptures that confirm that the reason they were doing all, because you just showed one good scripture, uh, which which is very helpful. But like, for instance, in Leviticus, it goes to great lengths. It talks about the blood sacrifices, but I'm not sure if I ever saw it 
explicitly say like these are all being done in expectation of what the most high is going to provide not saying that it doesn't because it makes sense to me what you're saying i was just curious if there's like specific verses or context or stories like for instance um you know in genesis 22 when abraham took isaac up to the mountain and kind of had that exchange about the sacrifice where the most high said he would send a lamb is there more like that that we can pull out just to, to have a a clear scriptural understanding that everyone knew they were looking forward to this Messiah and that's why they were doing what they were doing. Yeah, I wouldn't say that everyone knew. I'm just saying, you know, you know who knew by who he pulled out of hell when he came and who he left. Mm. So when he came and he died and he and, 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 and everything and said he went he went down to the depths of hell, there was a crowd waiting on him. Because he said, Abraham knew my day. He saw it and he was glad. He said, before Abraham was, I am. So what I'm saying is David knew. David knew because he prophesied in the scripture. He said, uh, you know, uh, not to leave, uh, you know, the Messiah's soul in hell or to, you know, allow his, his body to see corruption or whatever. So he, he prophesied about that in the song. So he knew. That that the Messiah was gonna have to come down into into hell, and he said, "Don't leave me in hell. Come get me." <laughs> you know, so those that he that got up when he got up, those are the ones that were living by faith in the coming of the Messiah, mm. and the ones he left were not. That's a beautiful point. I appreciate that. Mm. Yeah, so scripture is also clear, you know, for for our nation, you know, like he told Moses, he revealed these things to Moses. So when you go read the Testament of Moses and the and these other books on Moses, it was clear that Moses understood it. But you know, in the King James, he tells Moses, he said, you know, my people, you know, they understand my acts, but you understand my ways. You know what I'm saying? So he understood a, another level. Of Yah that the people didn't understand, and and Yah was saying they not they not getting it. They just they just all they do is see my acts, but they don't understand my way. But you understand my ways. I can talk to you like that. So yeah, so that's why we had to ask ourselves: Do I understand His ways, or do I just understand some acts? And so for me, when I look at scripture, I just see all the work that he's done. And it's easier for me to see him because I believe that he's the I am. I believe that he did 100% of the work. So if there's any work in there that's being done, uh, you know, to get us into the presence of Yah, I believe Christ has already done that. And so I can look at it and I say, how does this apply to the Messiah? And it just shows, it's, it it appears. Because by faith, I already believe that it's all about him anyway. So, all right, another, I, I said, it, it, this lesson was real good for me. Like it, it, it definitely had a lot of layers. So just to take it another layer on the blood. So with the blood of animals, there was different animals that were sacrificed and, and different, you know, at different times. Do you feel like that played a significance in the story of the of, of Yahushua? Oh, absolutely. Each animal represents a different aspect. The sacrifice that he made was so in-depth and so huge and so detailed that it he takes all of these different animals to explain to us the different aspects of our salvation because we really truly don't understand. It's simple. But it was so huge. It's simple. He died for me. I was messed up. He died for me. He went in my place. I accept that. Okay, I salvation. So that, that that's easy. The concept, of that concept. But the depth of what he did, and the height of what he did, and the breadth of what he did is so huge that he takes all these different animals to explain the different aspects like if he takes if he talks about the scapegoat when you look up the scapegoat in, in the in the book uh you know in the hebrew is azazel right 
we find out that Azazel was one of the, uh, you know, one of the angels that rebelled at the beginning. All right. We also, in other writings, understand that uh, Azazel, uh, the only way that he has power over you is to, is you, when he speaks to you, you answer him. That's how he gets his power. So from that, you begin to deduce then, this is what Yeshua was talking about, that he was going to have to, he was going to pay the price even for what Azazel influenced us with. He's paying the price for that so we could be redeemed even for the things that this angel had done. So the depth of it becomes even more. Then it becomes even more intense when you get uh, to uh, the night that he was going through trial and he finally had to close his mouth and he said, I'm not going to say anything else so the enemy won't have anything uh, for me. He was talking specifically about Azazel because that's where the power of Azazel was given if you spoke back to him. If he asked you something and he spoke back. I mean, it's deep. This, this thing gets deeper and deeper. Every sacrifice represents something, some different aspect. All right. So, you know, when you look at the goat, you know, when we get up on with Abraham and the goat, okay, and he says, where's the lamb for the sacrifice? He's pointing to the fact that, you, you know, he was going to be a lamb, but he was also pointing to the fact that he was going to be a goat. So when you look at the goat, and the goat had horns, right? And you look over, and the goat had his horns caught in a thicket. Right. The, the word for horns means power. And the thicket was like, when you look up, it was a thorny bush. So that means he had a crown. The base of the, 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 the goat had a crown of thorns on. So it's representing that Yeshua was going to give up his power, which he did and fall into your hands. I can remember my spirit. And also he gave it up because of the curse of the thorns that we saw that grew up after the uh, fall in the garden. He's got a crown of thorn on his head. The animal does. So because of sin, he was a crown of thorns placed on his head and he gave up his power. So when you look at the goat, it represents him giving up his power, taking on our sin, the curse, and him wearing that crown of thorn that represents that. So even in the Genesis, you see the Messiah crowned with, with, uh, with, with thorns, even in the goat. <laughs> oh, I mean, not the goat, but the ram. What well, the ram is is a is a type of goat. But you see the ram caught up in the thicket. Y'all with me? I'm just saying that everything about this thing is pointing to the Messiah. Everything. There's not one aspect of this that does not point. He fulfilled the whole of the law. I may not understand every point of the law. But man, I trust that he, I promise you, I trust that he fulfilled every point. And as I trust him more, he shows me more about the things that he fulfilled. So we could study that. We could study how, you know, he, he walked up the mountain range. It was the same mountain range, you know, that when Abraham escorted his son up that mountain range, that was there was a picture of the father escorting Yeshua up the mountain range. Abraham had uh, put son on, I mean, wood on his son back. Our father put wood on the Messiah's back as he walked up Calvary Hill. Same mountain range, exact same yeah. mountain range. You know what was what's incredible about that is it's the same mountain range with Abraham and Isaac. It's the same mountain range where David puts the 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 sacrifice for Yahweh, the same one. Mm -hmm. and it's the same one where Yeshua did this. Yeah, because if if I if I remember correctly, it was uh, uh I'm trying to remember. It was one of the Canaanites that they they bought it from David, like you were saying. David bought bought part of it back. Yeah, he, he might have bought both parts of it back, but it was different parts of the mountain. But it was the same place that they would end up putting the temple on. Yes, the Temple Mount. Right. So the 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 so he he ended up on the same mountain range where the temple was going to be built, being sacrificed in the same spot. 
that Abraham was sacrificed uh, or getting ready to sacrifice Isaac. It's, you can't make this up. Every detail about that is pointing to the Messiah. It's incredible how it wraps all the way back around to the verse in Revelation that my testimony is the spirit of prophecy. It's the spirit of prophecy. Yeah. So, I mean, man, it's, it's beautiful when you see it. Uh, even even uh, when you start talking about uh, the, the the three, okay, when they rolled up to the mountain, when Abraham and uh, rolled up to the mountain, th there were three men. It was it was Abraham, and there was Isaac, and there was one other man. All right, so he, you know, they told the one man to stay here with the asses. Me and my son are, son are going yon to the worship. All right, so. You see three, just like you see three on Calvary Hill, right? Y'all with me? But Yeshua had to go first. And so it was almost like he told, when he was on the cross, he told the uh, other man on the cross, he said, y'all stay here because I'm going yonder to worship. So he had to die first. And he was like, you know, I see you in paradise. Well, w when you look at those, Three, uh, when you go to the book of Jasher, whatever, you find out that one of them was uh, was Ishmael. And Ishmael, when they looked up the mountain and saw the place, Ishmael couldn't see the, the fire of God on the mountain, but Isaac could. Because the promise was through Isaac and not Ishmael. So there was, a, there was something that he could see in the spirit that Ishmael could not see because the promise was through him and not through Ishmael. So then when you get to the cross, there was one guy on the cross that accepted the Messiah, but there was one who couldn't see the promise because <laughs> he, 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 he wasn't his at that time. And so all of those things are there, all those parallels are there. That's my point. So. No, that was, that was really good. I, I feel like it, the more that I study, it's like, it, it starts to matter more. Prophecy seems to become more important the more that I study. Mm -hmm. And I start to see more of the prophecy, even through, you know, like, and, and I think your lessons have done a good job, like where you bring out so much with the feast days. And like, even towards this feast of dedication, like I'm interested in looking into it and understanding it and how it points to Yahushua. Because I think that that's something that is, is new in my walk. And I feel like it's a point of maturity and understanding that everything points to Yahushua and we have to find out how. How? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because if he says that his testimony, when he when he supplies his his his, his, his he's a witness, right? Because you don't have a testimony unless you're a witness. And so he's supplying his testimony. And he's saying that his testimony that he's given is fear the prophecy. He's talking about props. He's talking about how the whole word is talking about him. I was pointing to him. So now we have to then trust that and then, uh, you know, go seek that out and see how is all of these things pointing to him. If he fulfilled the whole of the law, how? Show me. You know, show me who you are. If you know, and, and that's why I asked when I first started, you know, if if you are who you say you are, there's got to be more going on here than what I'm seeing. So you got to be. I said, if, if, what these folks saying, what I'm hearing these folks say don't make sense. I'm sorry, Lord, it don't make sense to me. It's got to be more to this. Now, I asked them about something in the Old Testament. They told me it didn't matter no more. What? what? So you telling me that you wrote this whole book and it don't matter. And I just, I'm sorry, I just couldn't, I couldn't accept it. And so he started opening up my eyes and, and was allowing me, not allowing me to see uh, some things. So yeah, it, it's good, it's good stuff, man. I'm telling you. And uh, you, 
I, I want us to see the basics, but I also want us to see these type things. But, you know, that's why, but he says in his word that if you come after him, you must first believe that I am. Y'all you with me? You got to believe that he is the I am. If, if we the I am in any part of that, then it's hard to come at him if we put ourselves in there. If we interject ourselves, he is the I am. He said, then when we believe that he is the I am, then he is then becomes a rewarder of them that diligently seek how he is the I am. Y'all, y'all get what I'm saying? So first you believe that he is the I am, and then you know you, you seek out to him to see how he's the I am. That's why you know I talk about Book of John, you know, because all through that he's talking about the I am. I am the I am, you know. And so if somebody can just start off with that belief that he's the I am looking in the book of John, that's going to lay a foundation for them uh, that, that they can build on because they're believing it from that point on that he's all those things. And so as we move into the, the Hanukkah and we begin to talk about him being the light of the world, You know, then we we can you know we'll start seeing we'll start seeing him even in 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 Hanukkah. So, okay, so I have one more part to the question, but I see Samson had his hand up for a minute. So, if we have a little time, I, I'd like to ask one more. No, go ahead and finish your part. No, yeah, go ahead, brother. Uh, I'm, I'm enjoying the dialogue. I'll, go ahead. All right. <laughs> so, uh, so I guess the last question that I had kind of goes back to a question I was asking a little earlier, but now with with what we had this exchange has kind of made me change the the direction of my question so what is how does israel point to yahushua in the eyes like so for instance a lot of other nations uh as we have our you know our exchanges even now and today even how they treat us today how we have to relate to them today how does that prophesy or look towards yahushua in your mind or if, if have you ever had any revelation on that topic? Somewhat, you know, because he does call Israel his son. So think about it from from that perspective. But all right, so he 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 sends Yeshua down here, right? And for the most part, we reject him, and so we are basically judged because of how we rejected our Messiah. Because we had a way out, even after we all the we had fallen, we had a way out, but we rejected him, right? So we had to go through this whole thing of of being rejected and despised and all these things, open up the door for uh, the Gentile. But even in our disgust, you know, in our position, our vile position that we're in. We have a we have a false church that's rising up along with the true church. All right, so this is where it comes in for for us. All right, we're his son. We're his son too. All right, so he says, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to discern the hearts of the Gentiles by how they treat you, because they're going to have good words to say. They're going to have a nice doctrine, but the sign of their mind or not is how they're going to treat you. Not knowing who you are, not knowing that you're my son, not knowing that you're the apple of my eye. You know, if they follow my commandment, if they just believe on me and say, love your enemy, if they just believe on me and say, love your neighbor, if they believe on me, you know, and, and say, treat them like you want to be treated. He said, they don't have to know that you're my son because they will be following in my spirit and doing, treating you the way I want you to be treated, even in your disgust. They don't have to know your, who you are, your identity, anything like that. Just my heart would have them to treat you the right way. So he puts us out all over the world to test the whole world as to the true nature of their heart while we're in our disgusting position. 
<laughs> and I hope you can see it. So he disperses us all over the world. There's not one nation that we're not that we're not a part of. And we're there, and they have an opportunity to love us like, like Christ would love, because that's what they say, right? And so then he comes along and he's going to reveal to them who we are after they have already shown their cards and after they have already shown uh you know who they belong to y'all 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 see the dynamics that's going on here so now he says now i'm gonna judge the nation by how they loved you and this is when we get to the uh this is when we get to the uh judgment of the uh the sheep and the goat sheep nation goat nation so although we may be despised, although we may be at our lowest levels, although we we may not have risen back to uh, uh, the hierarchy that we are, have been assigned to, because gifts and calling is the most high with our repentance, we're going to go to the position that we're supposed to be in. But while we're being, you know, while we're lowly is when he's testing the other nations. Just like while he was lowly, he tested us. He came down in a form to us where he said that I'm, I'm coming ugly. He said, I'm not in the form that any should desire me. I'm going to come uh, wretched. You know, I'm going to come, you know, I'm not going to be attractive. And I'm going to see how you treat me in the midst of you. Not looking like you think I'll look and not saying the things you think I ought to say. How you gonna treat me? And we proved how we were gonna do that. We did, we proved it. So he puts us out in the world to prove the whole world with us. That makes sense? A lot. It's sobering. Yeah, I, I'm telling you, I, I would be shook if I was the world. And so this is this is where the um the you know that's why I believe that Job is a picture of what the uh what the other nations are gonna have to go through during the judgment. Because Job is a believer in the most high. Job, but he's not, I don't think he's an Israelite. And they call him in for counsel. Uh, uh, about us while we were in Egypt. Y'all go study that that uh, the one I did on Job, the study I did on Job. And so while we were there, he gave bad counsel against us, right? And so fast forward, he gave that bad counsel against us, and now he's worried about it. He's come to some realization that, and then he says stuff like, you know, the thing that I feared the most has come up on me. Now, even though he's he belongs to the most high, and even though he, you know, uh, you know, uh loves the most high and the most high loves him, he still gave bad counsel. <laughs> <laughs> and so he ends up having to suffer through a period of time to test his faith. Are you really mine? And that's what's going to happen to most of the other nations who say they are believers. They're not getting out of here without a test. Our faith has to stand trial. That's scripture. Do you believe on me even in the midst of trouble? You see, we were calling on the name of Yah even on the slave ships. We were calling on the name of Yah even while being burned at the stake. We were calling on the name of Yah while they were skinning us alive. We were calling on the name of Yah anyway, marching up and down the street, calling up on his name. Y'all get what I'm saying? We have never fully abandoned <laughs> And so the test is going to be for the other nations, will you say, though you slay me? Yet. Cause that's what they did to us. Though you slay me, yet will I trust you. 
They, they got to go through the test, man. They got to. So you can talk all your game all you want to. You can tell me, oh, I love you. We all the same. All you want to. But when that test comes, We'll see. He's going to weed out. He's going to weed out. Ain't, ain't none of us escaping this, y'all. Do not. But is our test still ongoing as far as mm. him looking at how we're treating each other and how we're treating the other nation? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, our test is ongoing. Yeah. So he's looking to see us demonstrate love. Oh, absolutely. How are we are we walking like he would walk? Yeah. Are we loving one another? Are we are we, you know, giving each other that that grace and mercy that we need to give each other in order that we might grow? Are we disciplining each other when we need to be disciplined? Out of love. Are we correcting each other when we need to be corrected? But we're doing it out of love. That's how I walk. There's a time and a season for everything. Yeah. Hope that I makes sense. The dialogue. Yeah, no, it, it does. It makes a lot of sense. And I feel like um, it, it'll be helpful as I study these scripts and, and, and I go on. So y'all bless. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if we, if we, man, if we can sell in our heart that he fulfill the whole thing, man, that's gonna help you out when you start reading scripture. All right, uh, I'm gonna see uh, uh, who is it? Samson. Did you you put your hand down? Did you did you want anything to say before we get out of here? Okay, you must have had to step away. All right, um, Norval. Hey, thank you. Um, I was just trying to find the scripture with Jeremiah in it uh, so everybody could read it for themselves. But it's a beautiful scripture, Daniel 9. And uh, I forgot what I was going to say about the other stuff, so I'll just go ahead and just say it about this. Uh, uh, it was a lot of things that they have said doing this part um, before you get ready to close that I was going to comment on, but I forgot it. So I'm just going to pass it up and uh, to just read Jeremiah uh, 30 uh, chapter uh, verses 6, 7, and 6 and 7, I believe. It says it says something like uh, seven. Uh, God is going to save Israel and uh, Judah. So when you see those, then you'll know you got the scriptures that I was telling you about in Daniel seven or Daniel nine. You know these are important scriptures for us because this is the, what God asked us to ask us to do uh, in praying for our ancestors, you know, to be saved and forgiven. Uh, and it's deep. It gets real deep on here because I know they're going to suffer because we were talking about the outer darkness before and how some of us are going to go to outer darkness because we were in disobedience and stuff like that. I believe that. Yeah, Leviticus, uh, Leviticus 26 too. Leviticus 26 chapter, yeah. And he talks oh, about, okay. yeah, he talks about uh, our, our mindset. And he, he he throws in there in Leviticus 26, he talks about that we need to accept why we went through what we went through. That's part right. of the repentance. He said, you got to accept that. You can't be blaming everybody else. You got to accept why, right. why you went through what you went through. That's right. part of the repentance process. That he, to go over, so read in Leviticus 26. <laughs> yeah. So I had so I'm going to read that. That's a good one. All right. Thank you for letting me share. Yes, ma'am. I can't wait till I get, read the, get the whole video. 
so I can see it. Uh, you see it all. All right. All right. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Well, let me hear. All right. Uh, Al, you had uh, you had something else? Yeah. Yeah, I just I had a, a quick comment. I think it was for Dante and Sheree. I think um, earlier on she had asked a question about like uh, being able to read the scripture and and have it, you know, not being afraid to kind of take that Bible and, and really get familiar with it. And I just I wanted to just say one comment about that. Um, and if I have the name right, I'm not sure. It was a while back, but um, I've always talk to people about this and, and I think that can answer earlier was really good go where the rock leads you uh for me one of the things that has helped me with reading scripture is understanding it as a full story you know and what I talk to people about sometimes when I'm talking about scripture is saying like if there was a series of books out there that told a full story you wouldn't just if you just start with volume three or start with volume four you're gonna miss some of what happened in volume one. You're gonna miss some of what happened in volume two. So understanding the scriptures as a full story and one full continuous story, I think it for me it helped to motivate me to actually want to read the full of the fullness of it so that I could then start to understand the parts a little better. So I don't know if that if that helps, but I just felt impressed to just say that. Yeah, that's good. You know, and it comforts me when I, I read scripture because I know that he did all of this for us. And he's not angry at me. He took all his anger out on himself, his son. <laughs> so so that he could uh, have this open dialogue with me without destroying me. All right. So, you know, and that's why he says in Jeremiah 29, 11, he said, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you and thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. So his thoughts toward us are not evil. All right. So we remember and, that. And also, uh, to Al's point and mm -hmm. to Cherie's point, one thing we can't lose sight of is that one of the greatest gifts that we have on in this earth is the ability to change our mind. Mm -hmm. Being able to read the scripture now, knowing that it doesn't mean what we've been taught gives us an opportunity to go to father say i'm going to read this again i want you to change my mind mm -hmm. change my mind that's a beautiful thing mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's awesome awesome thing because that's the power that he gives us the power to change our mind well, if we make up our mind then he moves on our behalf so read that word read that scripture pull them 66 don't books. pull them out <laughs> Go on, pull it out and start asking them questions. Like he asked, he said, ask, and it shall be given. See, you're going to be fine. He ain't mad because you asked. I asked a whole lot of questions. <laughs> he, ain't, he ain't been mad at me yet. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right, uh, Mark. So I have, a, I have a quick question. Um, you said, um, in Jeremiah 29, 11, where it says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, uh, stop of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. At what point, in, potentially in his mind, when, when he says, when his mercy runs out and his, he says enough is enough, does, with the thoughts of peace towards that individual or towards even his own people change? Because once his... If I'm understanding, once his mercy runs out and he's, he's had enough with that particular individual and he says, come on, let's go, he takes him out of this world or whatever, at that point, his the thoughts of peace would change, correct? No. <laughs> it really doesn't. His mercy doesn't end. The script says mercy is enduring forever. That's what I read. <laughs> So I, that's what it, that's what scripture say. No, and I think what you're alluding to is, uh, is the chastening of the Most High for His children. You say, oh, at what point will He chasten me? But that that's out of love. That's still to bring me to an expected end. So when you read that about Him chastening me, He's chastening me to get me to a certain point in Him. So He's not. If he was going to be tired of you, 
he would never have brought you in to begin with because he knew what you were going to do before he even put you on the earth. He knew everything that you were going to do. So the fact that he called you, oh yeah, I want y'all to hear it. He called you to himself, knowing everything there was to know about what you were going to do. And yet he called you anyway. <laughs> And so, and so when when you when you say that, I want to add in there him, him knowing. Uh, I think it's in Psalms where he says that. Um, I think David says that he knows my thoughts are far off. So even you know when he you say as he uh, knowing what we would do, he called us anyway, and he knows that the thoughts we would have at the age of twenty five. He, he knew the thoughts that you were gonna have before then. He considered it all and then made the bold statement to say that he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. All that crazy stuff he said Marcus is thinking and, and, and going through and the shortcomings and all the things that he you're struggling with. He said, I have already considered all those things. And I came to the conclusion because I love Marcus so much that I'm going to be the lamb slain from the foundation, I'm going to give him an answer before he even asked and realized that he needed an answer. I'm going to give him a solution before he even realized that he needed a solution. I'm going to have the plan already laid out before he even come into the realization that he needs the blood of, of, the, of the Most High to save him and wash him clean. I'm going to already have the blood prepared, sitting on the table for him, and when he realized that he needs the blood, it will already be there for him because I am the lamb slain from the fire. Man, you can't fool him. He knew what you were going to do before you got here. He said, but yet even in the midst of all that, I knew you before you got here. He said, and then I ordained you and I called you for a specific purpose. And he said, I did not call you according to whether you had done good or evil. He said, I called you according to my predestined plan. I called you according to my election so that nobody could say that I called you because you were either good or evil. You had done good or bad. I called you because I knew you before you entered into your mother's womb. And he said, now I'm trying to convince you and show you that the plan was already intact. You ain't got to worry about it. All you got to do is accept my plan. Y'all get what I'm saying? That's how good this thing is. All right? So he's not angry with you. He executed his anger on his son. And it said it pleased him. <laughs> he said, I'm glad. I'm glad I got this over with. It pleased me to put this on my son so I won't have to be mad at Marcus. It pleased me so I won't have to be mad at Dante and Sheree. It pleased me so I can wipe the slate clean on Hank and Marilyn and everybody and James. He said, it pleased me to execute judgment on myself so that I could reconcile you back to me. And now I'm just trying to get you to see the grandness of my plan for those who I have called so that you might come back to me and sit down at my table and sup with me and understand that my thoughts towards you were never evil, but always good. Man, that's, that's, that's good news right there. That's good news. Amen. That's that right there, boy. That's, that's some good stuff. But we got to get there. We got to stay. And we got to see that he is who he say he is. He's the great I am. And that he... Everything that he said he would do, he's going to do it. I hope that makes sense. So his chastening is not because he don't like you. His chastening is because he loves you. He said, because you know, if, he said, if I don't chasten you, then you're a bastard. You're not a son. Yeah, go ahead. Oh no! I was going to add add to that. Um, well, I was going to say how how would or could he, I guess, chasing us. But there, I feel like there's so many avenues and so many ways he could. I guess pertaining to how and what area of our lives do we need to be uh, chasing is how he would go about it. Correct? No, oh, yeah, he he got you, man. He know you better than you know yourself, and and you ain't gonna be able to figure out how he gonna come at you. He gonna hit you from a sideways. You gonna be like, Lord, where in the world did that come from? 
I need to get my act together. I did not see that one coming. <laughs> mm -hmm. He can even use the enemy to do so. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> the, the scripture said he knows those who are his. And he know exactly how to discipline. You can't premeditate your own discipline. You don't know how it's going to come. It, but I'm going to tell you, you know how to do it. He know exactly how to do it to get your attention because you're his. So, yeah, don't don't worry about that. He got you. <laughs> You'll know it when they show up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Any more questions? Not a question, but I have two words. Wonderful Savior. Hallelujah. He's awesome. And the more we learn, the more we see him. And, you know, man, it's just, it's just awesome, you know. So um, we'll continue to try to uh, go as, as, as lay it so you know, we can lay the foundation. So then when we build on that foundation, you'll be more secure, you know. Um, but, you know, I think by some of the questions that are being asked, we're, we're, we're getting there, we're, you know, to, to some of the more prophetic things. So that you, you know you can see his testimony. So you know he's leading us in the right direction. Next week, uh, I'll be out next week. So we'll uh, we'll meet back in two two weeks, y'all willing, and uh, go back and read John eight, and we're, and then uh, we're we're gonna uh, you know look at the light of the uh, you know in him was life, and the light was the uh, life was the light of men. So we're going to look at that from the perspective of, of Hanukkah. And uh, we'll see where he leads us on that. All right. Any more questions, comments? We'll get out of here. All right, Father, we just want to thank you for this day, this opportunity to see you as you truly are. We ask you to open up our eyes, open up our ears, so we might hear who you are and see who you are. And Father, lay the food out in front of us so we might taste and see that you are good. Father, we, we, we are, we're seeking you. We, we're, try, we're trying for understanding. And Father, we want to be diligent in our seeking because you said that you reward those who are diligent in the seeking. And Father, we want you to reward us uh, in knowing who you are. I mean, you promised, Father, that we should know the mysteries of the kingdom. And if we seek after those things and ask and, and seek and, and, and keep knocking, Father, that you open the door to our understanding. So, Father, in the midst of all those things, if we're not seeking you diligently, Father, we ask you to correct us and show us that we're not. We ask you to be open with us and show us where our shortcomings are in seeking you, that we, that if we're not seeking you with all our minds, hearts, and souls, show us those areas of our lives, open those things up to us, and give us an opportunity to begin to seek you as you deserve to be, 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 be uh, sought after, Father. The one thing that you mentioned in Scripture that you're seeking, and, and I know you got everything, but you said you were seeking a worshiper. And Father, we ask you to allow us to be those who come after you in that way, to give you the value that you need in your scripture, to say the same thing that you're saying about yourself in scripture. So forgive us of our many sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Father. Be with everyone that's represented here today. Uh, you know, anoint us from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. So that our, and help us to believe on you as scripture says, so out of our belly shall flow rivers of living waters and someone else can get life because you gave it through us to give to them. We just want to thank you, your son, Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Shalom. Have a good Shalom. week. Have a good week. All right. Have a great week. Right. All right. Shalom. Shalom. Shalom.